we're going to talk about the book, The Secret Doctrine, the magnum opus of Madam H. P. Blavatsky. A book has interested many people over the world, all over the world, many occultists, many scientists, many philosophers have gone through this book and they were inspired to lead the right kind of life and understand the secret wisdom which was part of the book. This is one of the fundamental texts of the theosophical literature. This is one of the fundamental texts of the theosophical literature. Incidentally, I belong to the Theosophical Society which has the international headquarters at Adyar, Chennai. So, this is one of the fundamental texts of the literature of the Theosophical Society. This book traces the history, this book traces the history of uh, the universe, so to say, from the pre-manifestation state to the present state and also talks about the origin of man, the development of man and the progress man has to achieve in the future. So, as a process, it also talks about the manifestation of the universe, the sustenance of the universe, the disappearance of the universe and the coming back again of the universe. So, this is what the book describes. As said, it also talks about the origin of man and the details of man which everybody needs to know because we are human beings after all. The statements are culled out, the statements are collected from the ancient lore, ancient mythology. So the author also relates and relies on the details of Nasadiya Sukta, for example, which form part of Rugveda. So the author also relies and recites or quotes the translation of the Nasadiya Sukta, which is the story of creation as mentioned in the Rugveda. The book takes and mentions, the book takes into account and mentions details of numerous mythologies and philosophies of the globe. And the writer or compiler, as she would like to call herself, she said she did not write the book, she only compiled the book. That's her way of putting it across so humbly. So the writer or compiler of the book, as she calls herself, was an extraordinary woman of this 19th century. She was well known for her occult powers and the divine knowledge which she has so successfully presented in this work, The Sacred Doctrine. She wanted all the information and the information which is provided in the book to be considered as postulates, as hypothesis. She wanted all the people to consider the information which she has put in as postulates or hypothesis for everybody to consider very carefully. And she said, each one should arrive at the truth all by himself. And using the information, using the information, if possible, as a springboard, because we use the springboard normally to go to the depth of a swimming pool. And she says, we use the contents of the book as a springboard to dive deep into the sea of knowledge and come out with the pearls of wisdom. That's what she wanted people to do who follow this text of the sacred doctrine. The author H. P. Blavatsky, Madam H. P. Blavatsky, did not claim any authority or she did not claim any status. Status meaning, she never said, I am a guru, I am someone who has to be obeyed. Similarly, she didn't say that she claimed an authority, that she comes from certain such a school and whatever she says is final. She only said 
the points which she is making, the presentation which she is making are all given as points for consideration by human beings and they are supposed to contemplate on it, they are supposed to meditate on it and then arrive at their own truths. So, arriving at truth is a long journey. So, the journey is incessant and continuous. So, one has to carry on gamely in spite of difficulties which will be part and parcel of the journey. And the journey has to be taken up with a lot of awareness. The journey has to be taken up with a lot of awareness. The text gives only occult philosophic information. The text gives not only occult philosophic information, it also provides details of the various civilizations which took place which are part of the globe. Like for example, the details of philosophies of Kabbalah, the Jews, the Chaldeans, the Egyptians, they all find place in this text, the sacred doctrine. Besides, of course, the details of the East, the Aryavarta or the wisdom of the Aryans and the Buddhists. So, for those who are interested, for those who are interested, it gives enough information in symbology and philology. Philology means the details of the various religions which have come up over the period of time into this universe. This book, The Sacred Doctrine, was published towards the end of the year 1888. It was published by the Theosophical Publishing Company Limited, 7 Duke Street, Adelphi, D.C. This was where the book was published. It has been provided, it has been produced in two volumes. Two volumes have been provided for readers. So, it has been produced in two volumes. The first volume talks about the story of cosmos, how the cosmos came up, how it came about, how the srishti, how the manifestation has taken place. What was the beginning, the very beginning of it? It was all darkness, she says in the proem. So, she talks about in the first volume, all about the story of how the universe emanated or the cosmos emanated. Universe, sometimes we restrict it to what we know, but there is so much of information which we do not know, which is part of cosmos. And there are a lot of other cosmos also, which are part of the scheme of things, which are part of the divine plan. So, the second volume, there are two volumes as I said, the first volume talks about the story of universe, the second talks about the story of man and together this book, both the volumes put together is approximately around 1500 pages. To be precise, 1474 pages according to the latest edition of the book published by the Theosophical Publishing House, ADR. It has the historical introduction. It also has the introduction given by Madame Blavatsky herself. And then there is another introduction of the subject proper by name Proem. And then there are details about the story of the cosmos and the story of man. These are all produced, all these contents have been produced using a language which was then called Senza, Senza and the stanzas of Zyan, Zyan, D-Z-Y-A-N. This is how the word is written and the occult commentaries on all those stanzas. They form the core text of the sacred doctrine. The, the slokas, the verses are all mentioned there and the commentaries of the verses, they form the core text of the secret doctrine. One has to understand this word jyan is a Tibetan word. The equivalent of that perhaps we can use is jyan. So, jhana slokas, perhaps you can call it that way, but they were written in a language censor which was ancient Sanskrit they say ancient Sanskrit 
and she had produced them, uh, translated them and produced it in English. And we have to go through these contents, understand these contents in a meditative state. Only then will we be able to perceive the information which is provided in the book. The Cosmogenesis, the first volume, has seven verses and 53 shlokas. Shlokas are compendium of two sentences or two rows of sentences. So that's called a shloka. This term is very familiar to us. It has seven verses and 53 shlokas and the commentaries of it also run for quite a number of pages. So Anthropogenesis, the second volume, has 12 verses and it is divided into 49 shlokas. So the origin and stanzas, the origin or the original stanzas are not traceable. They are not found in any of the European libraries or any library anywhere in the world. And Madame Blavatsky, Madame Blavatsky got access to this using her powers of astral light and her ability to go through the Akashic records. So this is how she accessed the information which she produced in the book. Now, shall we see some details about Madame Blavatsky herself, the author? Because then we'll know what tribulations she had, what trouble she had to undertake to produce this book. H.P. Blavatsky, as we have already talked about, is one of the exemplary characters of this 19th century. She was trained in occultism by rishis of the Eastern origin. She was trained in occultism by the rishis of the Eastern origin. She called them masters. She called them the masters. Masters who have actually mastered the art of living. The art of living. That is, living for that one unity which exists, living for that one unity which exists, and living for the welfare of humanity. And these masters do not have even a wee bit of selfishness or self-interest in them. So that's why they're called masters who believe in helping the entire humanity in all circumstances. So they are, they are the people these masters were the people who helped Madame Blavatsky to understand occultism and produce this text called the Sacred Doctrine. These masters are the part of hierarchy of the great white brotherhood. So Madame Blavatsky was guided and taught by these masters. Madame Blavatsky was guided and taught by these masters. So we in the theosophical circles use this word masters with a lot of reverence. We don't casually mention the word master for the sake of understanding of common man. It is something which a member or a sadhaka has to arrive at by understanding the deeper aspects of life. Madame Blavatsky was born on 12th August 1831. She passed away on 8th May 1891. So she lived a life of 60 years. She did a lot of work in that 60 years which she spent very usefully for the welfare of humanity. She was born at a place called Ekaterinoslav, a, which is part of the present Ukraine and then part of Russia. So she was born there. Her father was a military colonel and his name was Peter Alexvich Van Horn. That's his name. And her mother, her mother was Helena Fedif Andriana. She was a novelist. And she says, HBB says, that she picked up the perhaps the genes of writing from her mother. But Unfortunately, her mother passed away when she was 12 years old. When Madame Blavatsky was 12 years old, she lost her mother. And she was brought up by her maternal grandparents. 
her maternal grandparents, took care of her, educated her, and then she was living with uh, the grandparents. She had a governess. She had a governess, and the governess used to take care of her upbringing. And a lot of people used to assemble in the house of the great gentleman who was the grandfather, maternal grandfather of H.P. Blavatsky, who was a governor of the province. And a lot of civil servants used to come and uh, attend the parties or gatherings in his house. So in one of the conversations with the governess, she pointed out to one man by name Blavatsky and threw a challenge that she would marry him in less than three days. And she did that. She won the challenge which she threw to the governess, but she did not continue with the marriage. She was not interested in marriage, but she just did that to win the challenge. And uh, that Mr. Blavatsky was much senior to her age. In age, Mr. Blavatsky was older than Madame Blavatsky. And she did not even consummate the marriage, is what the records say, and she moved away from him. And he tried for getting a divorce, but in those days, I believe, divorce was not possible. And so the name Blavatsky continued with Madame HPB. So that's how Helena Petrova Van Horn became Helena Petrova Blavatsky. And she traveled all over the place, all over the world, and her travels were funded by her father. The travels were funded by her father. And at the age of 20, while traveling, while she was at London, she met her master and teacher and guru by name Master M in the Hyde Park, London. She met him in the Hyde Park, London. Incidentally, she saw him in a procession in the morning and she was resting in the park in the evening when Master M appeared before her and talked to her, talked to her. And this is the first time she saw her master physically. She had otherwise, the consciousness was very much close to her and she used to always feel that somebody was helping her, somebody was guiding her. But this is the first time she came across Master M physically. And the conversation went like this. Master M asked her whether she would like to continue her married life, beget children, carry on life like any other married woman would do, or whether she would work for the welfare of humanity, which work the masters were doing. The choice was given to her. The choice was given to her. And she picked up the second one, working for the welfare of humanity. Madame Blavatsky says there was absolutely no pressure on her to accept anything, the choice which the master had posed at her. But she chose voluntarily to work for the welfare of humanity. And she exercised her option to work for the welfare of humanity and decided to stay with her master. And she realized that her master was helped her, were helping her even when she was a kid. She was fond of horses. She used to even tame the horses which were wild. In one of the exercises, one of the times when she was trying to tame a horse, she fell down from the horse and she felt very secure in the hands of someone. At that point of time, perhaps she didn't realize it was her master who saved her. But then, after she met her master in the Hyde Park, London, she realized that was the same master who helped her to live and survive. And there was a purpose for her survival, and so she lived to accomplish that. She accepted the choice by saying, Thy bidding, I honor. Thy bidding, I honor. Whatever you say, I obey it. That's what he, she said and went through, throughout her journey, throughout her life. She stayed with that promise which she made to her guru. And she visited a lot of countries. She visited a lot of countries. She went back on her way back to Russia. She went 
in search of truth to so many places, Turkey, Greece, so many places she has visited and all in search of truth. And she tried reaching Tibet because she knew that is the place where a lot of enlightened masters used to live. So she tried reaching Tibet in 1853 and did not succeed for the first time because she went through Ceylon. At that time, Sri Lanka was called Ceylon. She did not succeed at that time. So a second time she tried reaching Tibet. Yet the second time also she did not succeed. This time she went back to Russia and her master used to guide her in occultism and cultivating the occult powers. So she practiced all that and she became an exponent of occult powers. All those powers she acquired and used it for the welfare of humanity, not for her selfish purposes. She never demonstrated it for selfish recognition. So she acquired adequate control and developed occult powers. She reached Tibet finally in the year 1870. So the earlier attempts, she did not succeed. But this time, she spent about three years at the feet of her masters and she learned a lot of things from various masters. Some were Tibetan, some were Eastern Rishis. So she learned a lot of matter, a lot of information, a lot of vidya from her masters. And she traveled back this time to New York towards the end of 1873 or early part of 1874. And at that point of time, she met one American by name Henry Steele Alcott. He was also a colonel in the army. He was also a lawyer. So she met him on 14th of October, 1874. Together, on the instructions and direction of the masters, with, along with 15 others, they founded the Theosophical Society on 17th November, 1875 at New York. Her first major publication, her first major publication was the book, The Isis Unveiled. And before that, she had written a lot of articles. In fact, a lot of stories she used to write to account her living. So she was a prolific writer and she wrote the first book, The Isis Unveiled, and it was published in the year 18. 77. Before that, there was another book uh, which was published by Epicinet, which was called The Esoteric Buddhism. But this is the book which Madame Blavatsky produced in 1877, which talked about the white magic and why people should not practice the black magic. And she described all about nature, how nature helps man, and how. She gave so much of information of various things which are present in various places, especially Egypt and other places like India. She wrote a lot of articles, as I've said, on spiritual subjects, and she took up American citizenship. She wanted to become an American citizenship. She wanted to become an American and took up American citizenship. She traveled to India, Bombay. At that time, it was called Bombay, along with Mr. Henry Steele Alcott, who was the first president of the Theosophical Society. And she was called the corresponding secretary of the Theosophical Society. Together, they traveled and they reached Bombay on 17th December 1878. They made Bombay as a working headquarters for the Theosophical Society. So on being invited by some people, because they have seen the book, The Isis Unveiled, they invited Madame Blavatsky to visit Chennai, now called Chennai, then called Madras. And again, inspired and guided by the masters, they chose a place, a suburb of Madras called Adyar, where the international headquarters was started. And they acquired a land of about 
13 acres to begin with, which was called the Huddleton Gardens. And there they started the Theosophical Society and the international headquarters of the Theosophical Society. She started living there. So she left <coughs> Adyar briefly in the year 1884, on 20th February to be precise, and left for Europe and she was accompanied by Henry Steele Alcott. Then at that point of time, she settled in Paris to study all about arts and the various exponents of the artists she wanted to meet and understand their deeper significance of the arts which they produced. She came back to India and left finally India on 31st March 1885. So then she travelled to Würzburg, this is a small ha town in Germany. Wurzburg, and she wrote the major portion of the secret doctrine living at Wurzburg. And she was able to publish the secret doctrine in the year 1888. The publishers helped her and she could bring out the book in the year 1888. She wrote few other books like The Important Being, The Key to Theosophy, which answers the various aspects of theosophy in the form of questions and answers. And then the voice of the silence, which is actually a spiritual, spiritually inclined people can go through the text for receiving proper understanding and practicing those precepts which are mentioned in the book, The Voice of the Silence. And then some of the articles which she had written earlier were produced as a book called The Practical Occultism. And her collected writings are there in about 15 volumes. So many articles she had written to various journals. They are called the collective, collected writings of Madame Blavatsky. They run to about 15 volumes. So when she, while she was actually writing The Secret Doctrine, while she was compiling The Secret Doctrine, she fell ill again, very ill at that point of time at Würzburg and she was not able to continue her work and again Master M appeared before her and asked her whether she would like to continue the work or quit her body. Either way it was okay with the Master but she preferred to work to complete the book at the, inst at the suggestion of the Master. Master said would you work though it is difficult to work for the welfare of humanity or would like to quit the body and take rest. Either way, it's all right. That is what perhaps the master had told her, but she preferred to withstand the difficulties which she was facing and completed the work while she was living in Würzburg, Germany. And she chose to complete the book and she went through a lot of tribulation, a lot of criticism, a lot of people called her so many things, she was called a spy, so many things. But still, she took all that in her stride and completed the work, Sacred Doctrine. And eventually, she passed away on the 8th May, 1891. Even to this day, 8th May, 1891, is celebrated as the White Lotus Day in the Theosophical Circles. So, in her remembrance, the Theosophical Society, I wouldn't say celebrate, observe, observe the day 8th May as the day belonging to Madame Blavatsky. They remember very lovingly the services she had rendered, the books she has compiled. So that's how she is remembered even today. In the historical introduction of the book, The Sacred Doctrine, given by the editor, Boris D. Zirkov, we have interesting details the subtitle of the book given was, the book is a synthesis of religion, philosophy and science. The book had a tagline as we call it now these days, but it had a subtitle which was called, the synthesis of the science, religion and philosophy. And this book was dedicated to all the theosophists living all over the world. This is how the book says. 
initially the Theosophical Society wanted to bring this book, The Sacred Doctrine, as a supplement to their official magazine called The Theos Theosophist. We have a magazine which is published even today, which is called The Theosophist. So, they did think in terms of producing a supplement to that particular magazine and produce this text of The Secret Doctrine as a supplement. But those plans did not materialize and she had to move to West Germany, Wurzburg to be very precise and completed a work there. And the book which she wrote initially, The Isis Unveiled, lot of people were not understanding the book properly. So, the masters wanted her to revise the text. In fact, the masters also say the work Isis Unveiled as well as the book The Secret Doctrine is a joint venture. The books are a joint venture because they also contributed their ideas. But having done that, they said certain people are not able to follow certain ideas mentioned there. Maybe more information has to be provided. So, the masters asked her to revise the book, Isis and Wade. So, an effort was made to revise the book. William Quan Judge was called in to Paris to assist her and he used to choose the portions which needed expansion. She used to choose the portions which need to be dropped and all that notes which she received from w. W.Q. Judge, William Quan Judge, an Irish lawyer, were very useful, was very useful is what Madam Blavitsky had said. So, though it started off as an improvement of the book Isis Unveiled, later on when she wrote a letter to Mr. A.P. Sinnott, she said, this book is shaping out to be a new book and we are going to call it as the Sacred Doctrine. And the synopsis and the contents of the book, the synopsis and the contents of the book were given to her by her guru, Master M. So, this is how the book got its synopsis and the contents which the master gave it to her and she had to follow that synopsis and the contents which she had to produce in that book. And she received many pages in an occult manner. She has said that, she has recorded it and even the historical introduction also talks about and the facsimiles of facsimiles of those letters are also produced in the book. So, these letters used to appear as she was traveling in a ship and they used to fall at her feet on the deck of the ship. And one gentleman by name Dr. E. F. Hartman, who also traveled with Madame Blavatsky, he confirms this, having seen these papers falling at her feet or onto the deck which she would pick up and those contents used to find place in the book The Secret Doctrine. So, this is how the masters helped her to write the book. Incident, incidentally, we have to mention, Madame Blavatsky did not have a big reference library. She did not have many books to refer to and write this book. While she wrote The Isis Unveiled or for that matter the book The Secret Doctrine, she did not have many books to depend on. This was confirmed by her friends who used to see her writing. So, how she wrote so many details is whatever subject she wanted to write, she says that subject appeared before her eyes and she could write. And there are so many quotations which she has made in the book and all those quotations, all those extracts have come before, appeared before her eyes and she could make them as part of the text, the secret doctrine. There was one person, there are a lot of people who helped her in writing the book. There was one person specially in Wurzburg by name the Countess Constance of Watchmeister. She was a countess, she was a of royal origin. She helped her, she provided accommodation, she used to take care of her needs. She used to even fair copy her manuscripts. She gave lot of help to Madame Blavatsky to complete her work. And 
HPP picked up quotations, which she says they all appeared before her in the rastral light. If you examine the book, before every chapter there is something quoted from some other text, not necessarily theosophical text, it could be from Shakespeare, it could be from anywhere. So she had the habit of using quotations in the beginning of the chapter, on the top of the heading of the chapter in fact. And it is said some portions of that book were dictated by the masters and the dictations also find place in the book. So in a way both the books the Isis Unveiled and the Sacred Doctrine are as said earlier the work is a joint venture or a joint venture. All the three Master M, Master KH and Madame Blavatsky came together to produce this text called the Isis Unveiled and the Sacred Doctrine. And she says, Madam says, the book contained the secret wisdom, Gupta Vidya as it is called, the secret wisdom, Gupta Vidya of the East. And under instructions of her masters, a small cover, the small corner, a small corner of the veil has been lifted and that could bring out so much of information. So that is what she says under the instructions of a master, a small corner of the wheel has been lifted and the information has been provided for people who would like to follow and understand and assimilate and use them for their occult journey. Wisdom, she says, will always be concealed to the profane eye, to the profane eye and even the masters are not allowed to reveal, she says. Even the masters are not allowed to reveal, they are closed, they are, they are closed. The information is not appearing before the profane eye, the eye which has no reverence to the occult subjects. And eligibility to earn, eligibility to see these wisdom, seek this wisdom is important. So to receive the information, one needs to have the eligibility and the information has been provided thanks to Madame Blavatsky, to all the readers who are interested in going through the contents. The wisdom is not to be used for selfish purposes. The secret wisdom is not to be used for selfish purposes. It is to be used for the welfare of the humanity. She says in an introduction, she wrote an introduction to the subject proper. She says that there is wisdom, religion. There is wisdom, religion, which is rightly the inheritance of all the nations in the globe. HPP talks about buddhi, a faculty of intuition is something which is part of that buddhi and through this buddhi, this intuition, the divine knowledge would reach the ego. The ego as for the theosophical parlance is a combination of atma, buddhi and the higher manas. Buddhi is also called the spiritual soul. It is the vehicle of atma as explained by the theosophical literature. Bodhi is a state of trance. Bodhi is a state of trance and bodha actually means innate possession of divine intellect. So she says the wisdom presented is archaic, very old and only outlines have been given. Little of the vital truths has been provided. Man has to fill the gaps using his own intuition, using the power of meditation and contemplation. It is meant for that sort of an exercise. The entire information is not put in the hand. The man has to strive hard to arrive at the actual information which he has to arrive at all by himself. She gives so many interesting details of well hidden and concealed libraries. The cave libraries for example she talks about. So in the introduction she said she had access to those cave libraries and she had taken extracts from those books and manuscripts which she has used 
in producing this book, The Sacred Doctrine. She says very humbly, she prepared a nosegay, a bouquet of all culled flowers, culled flowers, and man has to use them and understand what exactly the occult philosophy is all about. And this nosegay would help man to realize his true potential. She says she wrote the book to show that nature is not fortuitous, it is not casual, it is not accidental, and it is not concurrence of atoms. This is what she said. And then the secret doctrine is written to assign man his rightful place in this universe. Third, to rescue the degradation of archaic truths which are the real basis of all religions. This is the reason why the book has been written. And fourthly, she explains, it is all about the fundamental unity she is talking about and from which everything has come up. There is one unity 